Hey everybody, it's Nathan Cool with Swellwatch on SurfingMagazine.com. Just another update on El Nino. It's been a month since I posted my last video report on what's going on. A lot of stuff's happened since then. The markets are even jumping on the El Nino bandwagon right now, worried about consumables, uh, the growth of wheat, corn, stuff like that that could be traded across the market. Basically, all media right now is jumping on the El Nino bandwagon. Reminds me a lot of 1997, that year when the, we were priming for the severe El Nino that was going to hit that winter. So a lot of similar things are starting to show up. Uh, we're seeing wildlife washing up on shore that uh, isn't normally uh, washing up on shore in some areas. Uh, a lot of stuff's happening across the models. We're seeing a lot of signals uh, for El Nino that could be causing it to strengthen. So I wanted to give you kind of an outlook right now, how things look at the middle of the year right now, what we might expect for weather and surf for this coming winter based on what we know now and what we've seen uh, happen in the past climate wise. So let me give you a breakdown of everything that I've gathered so far and show you what we know. El Nino is definitely in the news. Uh, one of the things that we've seen recently, and you might have uh, been uh, seeing this yourself firsthand, these tiny little tuna crabs that have been washing up in Southern California and by the millions. A lot of this happened down in San Diego. And this is something that also happened around the 97, 98 El Nino. Didn't see a lot of this happen. Unfortunately, they, uh, all these crabs, it looks like they have died. They're not edible either for human consumption, but it's kind of a, a sad waste uh, that's happened, but it's a sign that uh, things have changed. But if you saw this, you, you probably were one of the lucky ones compared to what other people have seen. Up in the around San Francisco area in Oakland, these uh, blobs were washing up on shore. These are Mexican sea slugs. They're purple sea slugs that have washed up. People were calling the police because some of them actually look like human body parts. Uh, so this uh, information was shot by the... Uh, uh, some, some locals in the area. This was done by the East Bay Regional Park District. And uh, this uh, would definitely be a shocking sight to see, but the interesting part of it is that we're seeing sea life washing up on shore that normally wouldn't be to the uh, you know, uh, indigenous to the, the regions that they're washing up. And why is that? Of course, it's because of the strong signal that we're seeing from El Nino. So to kind of cover what all this means and also how this relates then to 97, how we're going to compare that to surf, wind, and weather, let me first just run through some of the models. So here we are. This is June 18th. Uh, the sea surface temperature anomalies uh, that shows in red the warmer than normal temperatures. And as we can see off the coast of Peru here, this red blob, that means it's indicative of El Nino. You see the little tail coming off of it? Well, that's because the warm waters have been shifting back eastward. Normally trade winds blow very strong across the equator and they leave that warm water mass over in the western Pacific. When it flip-flops to the other side, it flip-flops all our jet streams. It changes all of our weather patterns and that's what then causes El Nino. So let's just go ahead and look at how that relates then to something that we know. If we look at old models, this is a model from 1997. Same time of year, it was June 17th actually, 1997. Now this doesn't line up graphically uh, the same as the uh, previous model that I just showed you. But we can still see that off the coast of Peru, we've got that warm mass. Take a look back at what we're seeing now. It's extending about the same and it's got the same uh, signal, the same amount of anomalous temperatures and about the same type of tail. So we're seeing right now, midway through the year, uh, the same type of signal uh, that we saw from El Nino back in 1997. But that doesn't mean anything until winter hits. And this is from December 23rd, 1997, when we see that that tail of El Nino really grew. And what that is, we've got a large, large mass of very warm water, not just off Peru, but extending out to the uh, more western regions of the uh, Pacific. So compared to just having a small tail that's, yeah, we've got some anomalous temperatures, we can see that there's a very large mass that did grow in 1997. That's something that we have to see yet. If we take a look at the Jason satellite from earlier this year, this is in January 2015, we can see the same type of thing. We can see that uh, it, uh, warm waters were starting to travel back over toward Peru this time of year, that signal is hot. So we're getting a big difference in temperatures. So it is increasing. If we take a look at, the, at some of the charts that back that up, here's four readings off of different El Nino zones, different parts across the equator that are being measured to see what kind of anomalous 
sea surface temperatures we're seeing. Across the board, they're high. They're all going up. We take a look at into May and June, they're very high. Um, so El Nino definitely is here. We can then compare that to other years by actually looking at the raw numbers. So just really quick, let me just run through that to show you kind of what's happening. So 2015 is here at the bottom, and these are temperatures that are above normal, unless they have a, a negative sign next to it. Um, so we can see that recently we're at a signal of about 0.7 degrees Celsius above normal overall for the El Nino zones. Let's take a look at 1997. 1997 actually started out negative, and this time of year it was only at 0.1. That's all that it was. It quickly grew to 0.6, and then afterwards it grew even more, and a strong signal of 2.3 degrees Celsius on average above normal is very hot. If you take a look at the rest of these numbers, just scan it real quick, you can't see that number. It just didn't happen. That's why 97 was remembered as like the mother of all El Ninos. Very, very strong signal. Well, we don't have that information yet. We haven't gone forward in time. So we have to wait and see what happens. But even so, even looking ahead, 90, the 1997 El Nino had a, a signal of 0.6, uh, and that would be next month, where right now we're at 0.7. So we are still even warmer. But once again, too early to tell. Things can change very quickly. If we take a look, though, at various models that are predicting what could happen, this is a variety of models. Um, we're taking a look at uh, probably what, about a dozen different models here that show the projection for what El Nino will probably do. Over here on the left on the y-axis we can see the, the temperature anomaly and uh, everything above zero is El Nino, it's, it's anomalous. And then down here we've got three month time frames. And right now we're in this time frame which is May, June, July. And as we go forward in time, we can see that the El Nino signal would increase, though those equatorial waters would warm. And in some cases, it's showing that it would be very warm, right in around the 97-98 El Nino event, which is a signal of 2.3. Uh, some very outlier models are showing that reaching like 2.8, but uh, very unlikely where the majority of models are in around the 1.5 to 2 uh, 0 uh, Celsius anomalous temperature signal range. So that would still be a very strong El Nino. Even by what we're seeing here, it would definitely be a strong El Nino, but possibly not to the strength of 97, 98 El Nino. But wait, there's more. So the one thing that really backs up the El Nino is this specific decadal oscillation. I've talked about this before. It's the uh, shifting of, uh, it's, it's like a more of the El Nino's bigger brother. It's a shifting of the equatorial water temperatures, but in a very large way. And it does it on decades long scales. So if we take a look at 97, 98 El Nino, and we were going from a signal of about 1.83 on the PDO to 2.76, we're at about 1.2. Not as strong, but earlier in the year, we were very strong, well above two. And those strengths, those uh, sea surface temperature anomalies, very similar to what we'd see uh, for El Nino measurements as well. When we get into the range of two degrees Celsius anomalous, it's extremely warm. We know that a very strong El Nino is coming. So anyways, we've got all the elements to back up the El Nino. The El Nino is strengthening. We think the PDO will also back that up. And so some of the media is reporting the perfect storm of El Ninos, which actually could possibly happen. But what does it mean for surf? Well, there's a couple things that are being disrupted because of this. We think El Nino, yeah, large surf, winter's time. We're going to get those heavy rains also with it, but we could get some very strong surf, just like we did in 97, 98, Big Friday in Southern California, Big Wednesday uh, out in Hawaii in that January of 98 from the large winter storms. But the Southern Hemisphere gets affected. And this is the jet stream uh, down in the Southern Hemisphere. That's the gray area. You can see the winds. They circulate uh, like this. We've got Antarctica down here, there's uh, Australia, New Zealand, and what happens when we get a southern hemi swell in Southern California, it comes from this region that spans from around New Zealand over here to before you'd get over to, uh, to, to Chile. So that'd be fine if the jet stream uh, doesn't stay that strong and wants to stay near the pole, but if we take a look at what's happening with the jet, it's doing just that. It's strong and it's also driving storms 
down toward the pole. So those, you can see the, the, the leading lines of the jet stream, the wind barbs, and it's just pushing the storms away from us. And this is so very typical during an El Nino year. During La Nina, it's just the opposite. The jet stream's not as strong. It doesn't get pulled also down toward the pole as much because of the differences in how the weather systems have flip-flopped across the planet because of El Nino. In this case, uh, it's just about the opposite. So think of bizarro world. If we normally have Southern Hemisphere uh, swells in the summer, well, we're probably not gonna see as much of them. We do have, though, very warm waters that we're dealing with off the tropics. Going back to our model, we can see that the extremely warm water, this is, uh, is just great fuel for, for hurricanes to form. And uh, hurricanes, if they were on the East Coast, everybody would be worried about life and limb when they're out in our neck of the woods and they potentially either bring surf to Southern California, they could bring heavy rains obviously to, to Baja and uh, sometimes they come back and retrograde and hit Mexico and, and South America. But more often than not, they would be swell makers for Southern California and as such was the case with uh, Andres and Blanca. So that's how things are looking right now. So we, we did have, out of the hurricanes, Andres, Blanca, Carlos barely made it to, to, to work with name status, but it did become a name storm. It was very early in the season too. We're only at uh, June 19th right now. And we've already had three named storms in the Pacific. We do have some very warm waters. So El Nino, breaking it down. Southern hemisphere swells, eh, not as likely to see southern hemi ground swells. We're taking a look at something possibly more out of the tropics. We've already seen a trend of that. So we could see more hurricane swells. We've got warmer water in that area, so very likely to happen. Northwest, well, it's just not that time of year yet. When we take a look at the swells that could come out of the northern hemisphere, we're looking more at winter, obviously, and of course they could be much, much stronger. With an El Nino like we're seeing right now, just like 97, 98, we could see some extremely large surf, especially by January 2016. It also means that we could get some major drought relief for California, but it's all too early to tell. But I'll be keeping an eye on it. I'll be keeping you posted. You can subscribe to my YouTube channel and I'll be posting more videos. I'll try to do one every month to keep everybody updated on exactly what we're seeing. Try to keep out of the hype zone. So I just provide the data. Sorry if it gets a little bit boring, but it's the truth and not anything to get you all too excited about just so you watch more commercials. But speaking of ads, if you do click on one that you see on the video, it'd be much appreciated. It helps pay the bill won't cost you anything unless you actually do buy something from the sponsor. So in the meantime, subscribe to my YouTube channel. You can also follow me on Surfing Magazine. You go to forecasts.surfingmagazine.com. I do the California report. If you want to follow me on Facebook, it's facebook.com slash Nathan Todd Cool. So until next time, take care, be safe, and smile in the lineup.